Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Episode 81, Hellenistic Literature, Theocritus and Bucolic Poetry. Archete bucolicas muisai philai archet vidas. Begin, my muses, begin the herdsman's song. With this line, we witness the birth of a new literary genre, that of pastoral or bucolic poetry. A creation of the poet Theocritus of Syracuse in the early 3rd century BC, bucolic poetry shied away from recounting the epic tales of gods and heroes, or providing flattering panegyrics of monarchs, and instead chose to draw inspiration from the ancient countryside. Vivid descriptions of nature and idealized rustic life contrast heavily with the emphasis on urbanization associated with the early Hellenistic period, providing an inspiration to later poets who may have felt the call to what they believed to be simpler times. For this episode, I am going to be relying on the translations of Theocritus by Anthony Verity, published in a single volume by Oxford World's Classics, so any of my quotes will be drawn from there. Let us start with a brief biography of the founder of bucolic poetry. Theocritus was born during the turn of the 4th century BC in Syracuse, the wealthiest Greek city of Sicily. We know almost nothing about his early life and career, but he likely spent his formative years under the tyrant-turned-king Agathocles and his successors. Idol 16 is directly attributed to Hero II, who seized control of Syracuse around 270, and was possibly Theocritus' first patron. The poet would not remain bound to Sicily for long, though, for we next find him in the employ of the more powerful and wealthy Ptolemaic dynasty. Theocritus seems to have lived in both Alexandria and the Ptolemaic-controlled island of Kos, where he composed works in honor of Ptolemy II Philadelphus and his sister-wife Arsinoe II. This would have likely led him to rubbing elbows with some of the finest intellectual minds and artists of the day, like Aratus of Soli or Callimachus. Of his surviving output, we have a collection of 30 poems known as the Idols, or Idols depending on your pronunciation, and a group of 22 epigrams that are attributed to him as well. Despite his fame for the invention of pastoral poetry, Theocritus appears to have written in a variety of styles and subjects, which has led to controversies about whether or not they can all be accepted as truly Theocritan in origin. For the purposes of this episode, we will be focusing almost entirely on his bucolic poems, and ignoring the debate on authorship of his other works. Let us turn to Theocritus' most famous compositions, the bucolic poems. Generally speaking, this would include idols 1, 3 through 7, and 10 and 11. But the exact number varies depending on interpretation. The etymology of bucolic is twofold. The Greek bucolica, means pertaining to the cowherd, while the term pastoral is derived from the Latin pastoralia, pertaining to a shepherd. Fittingly, most of the idols include herdsmen as major characters, and bucolic appears to have been recognized as a genre in antiquity. Theocritus is traditionally considered as the father of bucolic poetry, but ancient writers do not directly name him as the inventor. Diodorus, Athenaeus, and the anonymous Byzantine author of the Scolia suggest that there was a tradition of herdsmen's songs in Sicily that stretched back to mythical times. It seems like an easy fit given Theocritus' Syracuse and background, but other locations and stories are suggested as well. Regardless, what we do know is that Theocritus was the most distinguished poet of this genre, and that his creations inspired several others to follow his style. Hi, I'm Serio. And I'm Umberto. And we're the hosts of So You Think You Can Rule Persia. A podcast where we rate and review all the kings of Persia from Diochis to Yazdegerd III. If you've been enjoying the tales of the Hellenistic world, join us for a look at the rulers of Persia before, during, and after the Hellenistic Age. We'll be discussing their lives and myths before ranking them all and deciding who is really worthy of the title of King of Kings. We hope to have you along for the ride. What makes a poem bucolic? To get a sense of what pastoral poetry is like, let us look at the most famous example, Idol 1. A pair of Sicilian shepherds are relaxing in the pastures when Thresis, the more musically gifted of the two, is encouraged to sing a song about the mythical cowherd Daphnis in return for goat's milk and a beautiful cup. Theocritus lovingly describes the details on the cup, which is decorated with rustic imagery. 
quote. At its lip winds an ivy pattern, ivy dotted with golden clusters. Its tendrils twist this way and that, glorying in their yellow fruit. There is a vineyard, heavily laden with dark grape clusters. A little boy watches over it, perched on a dry stone wall. Two foxes lurk nearby. One prowls down the vine rows, stealing the ripe fruit, while the other pits all her cunning against the boy's satchel. No respite for him, she reckons, till he has nothing left for breakfast but dry bread. But he is twisting a pretty cricket cage of asphodel, plating it with rushes, with never a thought for satchel and vines, absorbed as he is in his weaving task. End quote. With his interest piqued, Thresis then rises to the challenge and recites the opening lines of his tale. Quote, begin, my muses, begin the herdsman's song. I am Thresis from Etna, Thresis whose voice is sweet. Where were you, nymphs, when Daphne's wasted away? Where were you? In the lovely dales of Peneus or of Pindus? You were surely not by Anapus's broad stream, nor the peak of Etna, nor frequenting the sacred waters of Achis. Begin, my muses, begin the herdsman's song. For the rest of the poem, Thresis calls upon the tragedy of Daphnis, how he lay dying of lovesickness. Many visitors express their grief for the beloved shepherd's impending demise, where even the local wildlife took part in the lamentations. After an encounter with the gods Pan and Priapus, the goddess Aphrodite appears to rebuke Daphnis, but is chastised with a medley of mythological illusions. The song ends as Daphnis makes his final remarks. Quote, now end, my muses, end the herdsman's song. Come, lord, take this pipe, sweet-smelling from pressed wax and rounded at its lip. See how love now drags me off to Hades. Now end, my muses, end the herdsman's song. Now, you thorns and brambles, bring forth violets, and let the lovely Narcissus flower on the juniper. Let all things run contrary, since Daphnis is near death. Let the pines sprout pears, let hounds be torn apart by stags. Let nightingales cry out to owls at the day's dawn. Now end, my muses, end the herdsman's song. So he sang and ended. Aphrodite wished to raise him again to life, but the thread which the fates had given him had all run out. Daphnis came to the river, and the waters closed above the man whom the muses loved, and whom the nymphs did not reject. Now end, my muses, and the herdsman's song. End quote. The story ends with Thresis claiming his prize, and the herdsmen return to their duties. From this example, we can see the characteristics that define the style of bucolic poetry. As mentioned earlier, the terms bucolic and pastoral are derived from words that tie to herdsmen, and all of the idols feature shepherds or cowherds as the main characters. When we look at the subject matter of the bucolic poems, we can see how remarkably down-to-earth or even mundane the scenarios are. There are no battles between great armies, no slaying of monsters, no recounting the affairs of the divine. We find them instead engaged in friendly singing competitions, taking a break from the tending of their flocks to wax lyrical about tales of romance and pipe-playing. Their world is one of tranquility, where nature's beauty is powerfully communicated through passages that clearly represents an, for a lack of a better word, idyllic lifestyle. Take this example from Idol 7, where Theocritus paints the picture of the island of Kos as his subjects traverse through the countryside. Quote, Eucritus and I and pretty Amintas turned aside to the farm of Frasidamus, where we sank down with pleasure on deep-piled couches of sweet rushes, and vine leaves freshly stripped from the bush. Above us was the constant quiet movement of elm and poplar, and from the cave of the nymphs nearby the sacred water ran with a bubbling sound as it fell. Soot-black cicadas chattered relentlessly on shady branches, and the muttering of tree frogs rose far off from the impenetrable thorn bush. Larks and finches were singing, the turtle dove moaned, and bees hummed and darted about the springs. Everything smelt of the rich harvest, smelt of the fruit crop, Apples and pears rolled all around us, enclosing our bodies with plenty. Branches reached to the ground, bent with the weight of plums. Men broke for us four-year-old seals from the mouths of their wine jars. End quote. 
Though Theocritus may be drawing upon the real world, it is very apparent that his musings are firmly located within the realm of fiction. The life of the rural peasant is depicted as something of a paradise, with none of the hardships associated with manual labor. Perhaps the only affliction presented in these works is lovesickness. It is possible that Theocritus, a poet who spent most of his time working in major urban metropolises like Syracuse and Alexandria, aimed at endowing his audience with a sense of nostalgia for simpler times that never quite existed. While the portrayal of rustic living may be an original aspect of Theocritan poetry, this is not to say that they do not base much of their charm on the reliance on, or variations of, other literature. Each poem is written in dactylic hexameter, a rhythmic structure normally reserved for epic poetry, such as the works of Homer or the more contemporary Argonautica of Apollonius. Though simple herdsmen may be the main characters of these works, allusions to myth and epic poetry abound. In Idol 1, the description of the cup won by Thresus is similar to the passage describing Achilles' shield in the Iliad, albeit with less emphasis on the epic. Daphnis, the legendary founder of pastoral poetry, makes an appearance in Idols 1, 6, 8, and 9. One of the interesting ways that the bucolic ideal can be applied in Theocritan poetry is the treatment of Polyphemus, the sheep-rearing Cyclops made infamous by his dealings with the wandering Odysseus. In the Odyssey, Polyphemus is unequivocally portrayed as a monster who consumes the flesh of men. Theocritus, instead, chooses to cast him as a sympathetic protagonist in Idols 6 and 11, lovesick and pining after the sea nymph Galatea. While this may seem like a curious choice, Polyphemus does fit the criteria as the subject of a bucolic poem. By definition, he is a herdsman, capable of singing songs, and he too lives near Sicily. Theocritus even describes Polyphemus' song in Idol 11 as shepherding his love. The tradition of a romantic bond between the Cyclops and Galatea was explored around the turn of the 5th century by Philoxenus of Cythera, a poet working at the court of Dionysius of Syracuse. There is a strong chance that Theocritus heard this story passed down in his youth, and was inspired to incorporate it into his bucolic themes. Polyphemus is self-described as bestial in appearance, exemplifying the most frightening or ugly aspects of the natural world. Yet Polyphemus can provide many wonderful things because of his role as a shepherd, in spite of his shortcomings. Quote, I know, my beautiful girl, why you run from me. A shaggy brow spreads right across my face from ear to ear in an unbroken line. Below is a single eye, and above my lip is set a broad flat nose. Such may be my looks, but I pasture a thousand beasts, and I drink the best of milk I get from them. Cheese, too, I have in abundance in summer and autumn, and even at winter's end. My racks are always laden, and I can pipe better than any cyclops here when I sing, my sweet Pippin, deep in the night, of you and me. Come out, Galatea, come out and forget your home, just as I sit here and forget to return to mine. Follow the shepherd's life with me, milking and setting cheese with the rennet's pungent drops. End quote. Indeed, much of the song of Polyphemus is dripping with irony when hints are made about the eventual arrival of Odysseus and his crew, which eventually leads to the Cyclops' blindness. An audience that is sufficiently educated enough to understand the allusions can thus appreciate these works more, which supports the idea that Theocritus was probably not intending to realistically capture the essence of simpler living. In some sense, it is easy to imagine that the shepherds in the idols are an effective stand-in for Theocritus and poets in general given their shared passion as songwriters and wordsmiths. Following the works of Theocritus, there was Moschus of Syracuse and Bion of Smyrna, who are the only other named Greek poets who dabbled in bucolic poetry. Little of their work survives, but some scholars believe that a few of the idols which we attribute to Theocritus may belong to these two, or perhaps otherwise unknown poets who tried to imitate the Syracusan. We at least know that the first edition of the bucolic poems was compiled by Artemidorus of Tarsus in the early to mid-first century BC, who proclaimed that, quote, The bucolic muses, once scattered, are now all gathered into one fold, into one flock. End quote. Shortly after Artemidorus's efforts, 
we find the most famous heir to the bucolic tradition, Publius Virgilius Maro, better known as the Roman poet Virgil. As he emulated Homer in his masterpiece, The Aeneid, Virgil gained an excellent start to his literary career by composing a series of poems modeled on Theocritus's pastoral works, known as the Ecloges. These proved to be extremely popular in Rome, with public performances of his poetry helped spreading his fame. Each of the ten poems borrows extensively from the imagery and stories employed in Theocritus's originals, but Ecloge V contains Virgil's most explicit reference to his Syracusan predecessor. Not only is it similar instruction and story to Idol 7, but a passage spoken by the character Menaclus is actually a meta-commentary on the relationship between Theocritus and Virgil himself, who owed so much to his Greek mentor. Quote, My heaven-born poet, your singing is to me like sleeping on the grass when one is tired, or slaking a noonday thirst with a fresh drought from a tumbling brook. Not only do you pipe, you sing, as sweetly as your master did. Happy young poet, his mantle falls on you. <laughs>